Welcome into this Five Clubs Conversation. I'm Gary Williams. You know I'm a book man. I love to read. I've got a new book for you. It is Rainmaker by Hughes Norton. And for the younger set who might be unfamiliar with him, he was a golf super agent. So much so that he was Tiger Woods' first agent. Well, he worked for the man who created the entire sports agent industry, Mark McCormick. His thoughts on his relationship with Tiger and a host of other historic players like Raymond Floyd, Greg Norman, Fred Couples, Mark O'Meara, the list goes on. What changed, where we are now with men's professional golf, and where are we going? All of it ahead on the author of Rainmaker, Hughes Norton, right now. Split second, your hands make all the difference. It was time for a grip to help them own the moment. Introducing Reverse Taper, technology to stabilize both hands for a more square putter face at impact. The most important split second in golf. Reverse Taper, only from Golf Pride. Respect the grip. And with that, we welcome in the author. He spent his whole life wanting that to be the preface to his name. The author, Hughes Norton. How are you? Gary, I'm well. How about yourself? I'm, I'm doing great. Um, you know, your publicist was kind enough to send me an advanced copy of Rainmaker about two months ago. And I, I consumed it very, very quickly because so many of the people that you, you share stories about in your relationships – as somebody who represented a lot of these people or people that I grew up, you know, watch and play golf. And then I reread it again last week. And there were things that I think are, are indicative of a good book, things that you learn for the first time after reading it a second or a third time. Let me start with this. When you have the kind of life you've had and the exposure that you had to so many people in the golf industry, did the thought of writing about stuff like this start 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, when did it really crystallize in your mind that I want to do this, I'm going to do this? Very recently, Gary, and, and that's a great question, given all the number of years that have gone by, but never thought about writing a book. I really didn't. Um, in my uh, life sequence, when I got fired uh, by Mark McCormick at IMG, I had a wonderful severance agreement, but it had uh, handcuffs on it to not only not work in the sports management business, but uh, not to talk about or, or reveal in any way what had gone on in my career. And that lasted 10 years. So now we're at 2008 and uh, 10 years is a long time. And I had any, you know, latent desires to write about my life at IMG had sort of gone away. And I moved on to sort of a quiet life of enjoying my grandkids and uh, playing some golf and just being out of the, the whole rat race. And then a couple of years ago, and you know this gentleman, Chris Mohop, uh, who used to work at IMG, now is at Wasserman. Yep. Um, he said, Hughes, you know, you really ought to do a podcast. I, I know this really great guy, Chris Solomon at No Laying Up, and you've got a lot of stories to tell. And I was dismissive, as I always have been, because – all during those 25 years, Gary, uh, the media from time to time would check in with me. Hey, I'm writing a book about Tiger. Give me some insights on that. Or tell me about your time with Greg Norman. The Washington Post just did a giant piece on him you know, within the last year. And this guy was constantly badgering me to do that. And I really always took for for rightly or wrongly, I tried to take the high road and thought, I'm not going to say anything. You know, there's no point dredging up, you know, old memories of uh, some of which were pretty, pretty uh, painful. So I just said no comment all the way through. So fast forward to 2022. I did the podcast with uh, Chris. And yep. by the way, you know, I'm such a dinosaur. I could barely spell podcast. I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I, and then lo and behold, I realized how much content is now consumed by the, the generations, your generation and, and younger. 
And for the next month or so, Gary, 15 or 20 times walking around town or seeing people at the club where I belong, hey, that was a great podcast. Really enjoyed that. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And didn't think anything of it. Then I get an email one day out of the blue from George Pepper, who I had been in the business with. You know, George was the editor of Golf Magazine. And I was on the other side of the table from George in negotiations for our clients to become playing editors of Golf Magazine or to do books, which George authored. For example, he worked on a book with Curtis and a, on a book with Greg. So we knew each other. He knew me, friends, adversaries sometimes, but we did that famous 54 holes in one day junket, you know, oh, St. Yes. Andrews, Wingfoot, yes. Pebble Beach. George, George invited me to do that. So we knew each other. But we've been out of touch for 10 years, as I have been with most of the people in the golf industry, frankly. An email arrives, Hughes, loved your podcast. Is it finally time we did that book together? Sincerely, George. And that was the catalyst. And that was two years ago, almost exactly, Gary. And uh, off we go. There are there, there are a lot of wonderful stories in here. I, I think most of them are actually quite endearing. I think people would say, oh gosh, he's got, he's got access to grind. Wait until he exposes this person and that person. I didn't feel that. I think part of it, Hughes, is because vulnerability is, is part of what makes up all of us. Um, and we all have our own stuff. Um, and a lot of this, I think, is, is, is colorful. It's anecdotal. Uh, it's not indictments on people. Um, but I also think and, and again, this is my psycho uh, psychoanalysis of you at the dime store level. I felt in reading this that you were making admissions about yourself that were pretty damn forthcoming. Um, could you have made those admissions five years ago, 10 years ago? Was this the time that George reached out to you that was the perfect time for you to say, you know what? I got stuff I need to share about me. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, Curtis, in fact, one of my favorite and longest tenured clients. Yes. Uh, very, very important client at, at, at that point in my career when I signed him, as you, as you saw in the book. But Curtis, we sent him a manuscript because we were hoping he'd give us a, one of the blurbs on the back jacket. And he read it and he said, hey, I like this. He said, you know what I like best, Hughes, is how honest and forthright you were. And it, it wasn't just all the great stuff I did. And then I got screwed by a bunch of people. It was Here's where I screwed up. Here's what I did wrong. He said, that really was endearing to me. And he said, he said that's going to make the book much more authentic. And that's the word, Gary, that George and I really, from the beginning, tried to live up to. I said to him, George, I'm going to tell the, you know, the warts as well as the achievements. We got to be, we got to be real here because uh, I want people to know what an agent goes through. It isn't just, you know, $60 million contracts for Tiger Woods on the day he turns professional. That's, that's, not really real. It's very unusual. Let's get into the behind the scenes, you know, day to day slog that sports agents, specifically golf agents, go through. So we tried to um, to just be real and be and be truthful and authentic. And a number of people who've read it and your point is have said, God, you're awfully hard on yourself. Here. Yes. You know. You are. You are. So, and and so I, I don't know if it's I, I don't know you. So I don't know if you're being too hard on yourself. What I'm saying is, is that you are whatever whatever veneer you might have had. It doesn't exist in these pages. Your self-examination is critical. Um, it's 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 honest. Um, and it's almost as if there's some type of amends that is being conducted here by you. Is that too strong? I think so. I never had that word in mind. I just said, let's roll with it, George. Let's go through it chronologically. Along the way, I'll remember a lot of things that happened and and sadly forgot some that I probably should have put into the book, Harry. But, um, you know, and 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 I'm going to just lay it out for you. And he's such a it, it's really worth mentioning if, if it's a good read and you're testifying to that. So much of that is George. I mean, he's an incredibly talented writer. He's always been my favorite golf writer. And so not only was it was it perfect for me um, to to have him tell my story because he knew me, but but his his way with words, his his flow, absolutely terrific. And he's you know, uh, he downplays that he poo poos that he said, oh, you know, I'm just your caddy in this. And, 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 and it's a lot more than that. And, and again, back to the authenticity, he knew me all during the period that we're describing. 
if I put, if I chose golf writer X and had never had any history with him or her, it would have been a, a whole different narrative the way it played out in my opinion. So that was, that was really important. There, uh, I, I want to share that again, there's a lot in here that I've underlined in the book, but just coincidentally, very early in the book, um, and you don't, you don't spend a great deal of time talking about your relationship with your dad, but you said something that made me smile, but I think is absolutely true. You said, one of the few tidbits of worldly wisdom my father shared with me came out of nowhere one day when he wistfully said, Hughes, never feel bad when you're alone because you're in good company. It's an excellent, fabulous line. Have you always been comfortable alone? You know, little did I know how how what a foreboding that was of my life, Gary, in terms of the breakup of my marriage, Greg Norman uh, going his own way after 11 years with me, Tiger firing me, McCormick firing me. Uh, I've I've tend turns out I I am alone a lot, you know, and have been, and it's never bothered me. And I can't tell you those words of my dad were ringing in my ears all these years, but nevertheless. It's been, it, I'm very comfortable. I, I kid people sometimes. A friend will call me on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, say, hey, what's going on? I say, you're the first person I've talked to today. He says, what? I said, I haven't said a word. I got up this morning at 7.30. This is the first time I've spoken. And people go, whoa, seriously? <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm com- I've, been, I've been comfortable with it. Of course, it wasn't true when I was working um, all those years at IMG. But, but since, yeah, uh, I never sit around and say, uh, geez, I wish I was still working or I wish I could still be agenting all these stars or I wish I could be surrounded by friends. I mean, when I am, I'm great. I have a wonderful time, but it, it, it's not part of my DNA, I guess. For for people who might be a, a little bit younger, who are trying to understand and have context about, you know, what you did. Um, and again, you, you were you were such a, a omnipresent figure in, in an industry that was exploding, particularly after you, you signed Tiger, and the acceleration of dollars and purses went to where it did. But I, I want to give people some context of, of your life. You go to Yale. You're on, a, you're on the hockey team and the golf team. You get an MBA from Harvard. And you actually, I think, entertain the idea of being either a radio or television gas bag like I am, uh, which <laughs> would have been interesting because you loved it. There's no doubt you love doing it, but you got exposed to Mark McCormick because he would come and speak at, at Harvard's business school and you were taken by what he was doing. And you had an interlude with him where you drove him to the airport and that began a dialogue which subsequently turned into employment. Um, the, when, when that happens, and oh, by the way, you had an option, an option to go work in the television industry for a Titan in Tom Murphy, who I had the great pleasure of playing a few rounds of golf with when I was a young man. Um, regret. We all have regret. Uh, you don't have that many regrets when it comes to that choice, one industry or the other, do you? Well, a couple of moments after McCormick handed me my pink slip uh, in December 1998, <laughs> I had big regrets. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell have you done for 25 years? Yeah, I don't dwell on that. You know, it's the road not taken in life, right, Gary? You you can never know what might have happened. Would I have would financially for sure it would have been much better for me because you you trace the track the history of what Murphy did with Capital Cities Broadcasting and he buys ABC, this little conglomerate of television stations. That's a pretty bold move. And then that company is sold in the end for billions and billions of dollars. So one of the things we didn't have at IMG was equity. Mark didn't believe in it. Uh, one of the mastermind things in my opinion that he did was keep a handful four or five or six of us who were driving all the revenue in the business there for 20 years without any participation or ownership in the company you know i don't think it would happen today uh, maybe we were all stupid we were all driven we were all young energetic but we we, we didn't ever we, we talked to him about it but he would never he would never relent but um i think probably the thing that made my decision I think it was subconscious at the time, and I talk about it in the book, was my dad's career in broadcasting had been checkered, to say the least. He'd lost his job and then got another job in broadcasting and lost it. And I thought maybe somewhere in my mind, you know, this is a, I don't want to go through what he went through. Let's give sports, you know, sports a try. And by the way, you know, when you're 25 years old and you're sitting in an auditorium at Harvard Business School and some guy stands up, remember, 
if we have 10,000 sports agents today, they were none then, zero. Nobody, the, the business didn't exist. And here's this guy saying, yeah, this is what we do and we represent athletes and we have blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, wow, who wouldn't want to do that? That's incredible. So what are you going to do? I mean, you you think about where you were pri- you know, prior to your own business sure. now with five clubs and all, all the things. Um, maybe you have regrets that at the Golf Channel, something else might have happened, but you just you just move on, you know, and you've been so successful with it. I'm sure you don't have any regrets. So I try to I think regrets kill you in the end in life. They really they do. They're, they're terrible. They're, they they eat away at, 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 at progress about going forward. So if I had any, I, I, I pretty much dismissed them. Yeah, I, I think that's a very practical way of looking at them. And I'm like you, I don't I wouldn't define them as regrets. Uh, do I have decisions that I made uh, that I look back on that I don't want to forget because they're constructive? Uh, if something similar is in front of me that, that you know, I, I go, well, gosh, you did the opposite the last time. And I'm with you. It, it's, not, it's not a healthy thing to, to have stewing. Let me read you a line that, that you said. And I mentioned the name Tom Murphy. For those folks unfamiliar, a, a really important figure uh, in the proliferation and kind of the consolidation of what was happening with television uh, in the 80s, uh, you wrote, Tom Murphy was unrivaled in our industry, not just for his business achievements, but for his impeccable ethics, his unwavering kindness, and his bold, his boundless generosity. Mark McCormick would never be described quite that way. Um, you had some challenging things to say about Mark um, was he a better boss than he was a person? For sure. And I, I don't think he was a bad person, but he could never let that out. He was so driven, Gary, so 100 miles an hour all the time, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, driven. There ought to be a picture of Mark in the dictionary because he, he really was just boundless energy, uh, and enthusiasm for what he was doing, building this conglomerate. You know, he took the, the, the luckiest moment in, in, in probably anyone's life when he woke up one day, uh, was part-timing. Uh, he was still a lawyer in Cleveland, and he was, you know, doing exhibitions for golfers because he knew a few of them. And lo and behold, about a year and a half later, he's representing Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, and Jack Nicholas. And as he says, you know, I'd hit the lottery. I mean, that was never, ever going to happen again. So that's a major point in his life. Uh, and we talk about it in the book. It's really interesting. Talk about the road not taken. Do I just stay with these three guys and kind of be the, the Brian Epstein to the Beatles? That's all. I, that, that's the only guys I have. I can be rich. I can have a lot of fun. They're all my friends that play golf and a lot of golf. Or can I take what I've learned about representing athletes with these three and expand it into fields like tennis, team sports, and all the other things that ultimately happened at IMG. So back to your question, um, better boss. He was a very demanding and, and, and difficult guy to work for. Uh, but he also was, he would recognize achievement and talent within the company and reward those of us who, who, who got there. Um, but he was, and in, in private, I, I want to say in private life, he wasn't a bad guy and probably was a pretty good guy, but he essentially had no private life. His entire life was work and, and growing IMG and more divisions, you know, more revenue, building a legacy. Um, and, and I wouldn't say he's a great boss or a great, you know, person. He's somewhere in the middle, but I mean, his achievements are, are legendary. Yeah, no, he's one of the most important figures in in sports history uh, mm-hmm. because of what he created, and then and then obviously what the industry became. Um, you know, I, I'm a believer that that you know history will educate you about the past, and a lot of times it can it can explain the present. Um, you have some critical things to say about Greg Norman. Does his history and history that you had direct exposure to? Give us a better understanding of who he is right now. You know, probably Greg was a very uh, uh, stubborn person. He was a very 
he was a huge believer in his own his own abilities and what he had accomplished. You know, he starts out as an assistant golf pro in Australia, making eighteen dollars a week. And in those days, he was so convinced of his own uh, talent, he would play thousand dollar golf matches. Um, and you have to admire that. And he won most of them, frankly. And he developed into a you know this global sort of icon. And along the way, whenever whenever things sort of happened around him he definitely had a trait of blaming other people and holding grudges um and very stubborn and you know i'm i'm straight ahead and whatever's in my way it doesn't matter and i think you see that you know uh revealing itself in all that's happened with live golf for sure um and uh along the way acting acting as he did you know he wasn't the most popular guy in golf fred couples was quoted i think last year as saying uh uh you know greg has been disliked for 25 years which for fred you know who never says anything bad about anybody was pretty amazing um but he's a uh, he, he was a he's a fascinating character and you have to admire you know we talk in the book uh gary he he against my better judgment uh rolled the dice with cobra golf uh, yes. When I thought he when I thought he shouldn't. Again, the risk taker, the young kid in Australia playing for a thousand dollars when he had ten dollars in his pocket. Um, he took that risk and it worked. And I think every time one of those things happened, he became more convinced of his um, uh, so not a business tycoon, but kind of a business magnate and 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 vision, in my view, um, you know, business traits or beliefs that maybe he didn't possess. But his confidence was such through the whole process that he's he's done pretty well. You know, people have speculated I, if, if the Saudis haven't paid him 50 to 100 million already for running the show over there and standing up to the, all the, the slings and arrows of, of, of hate and objection from the rest of the golf world, I'd be very surprised. So financially, he's he's hit home runs for sure. You know, Hughes, it's Greg is is interesting on so many levels. He was gutted in ways that if it happened in a couple of weeks at Augusta National at anybody, particularly a big star, it would be examined forever. And it's not that what happened in 86 hasn't or again in 86 with Bob Tway or in 87 with Larry Mize. We can go on in addition to, to major championship guttings, but also, you know, whether it's Robert Gamez or, or David Frost, I mean, the guy has got. I mean, he's got a Rolodex of heartbreaking episodes. And here's the thing. When it happened, I thought that he expressed a, a pragmatism that, that was like, wow. But but I always felt, Hughes, that people were like, he doesn't seem bothered enough by these losses. Like Jack has always been described as the, the greatest loser. He always, you know, puts a hand out. But with Greg, it was like, this isn't bothering him enough. Do you think he was bothered when those things were happening to a degree that he never exposed? For sure. I mean, there were there were cries on the beach with his wife, Laura. You know, it, it, you can't go through such devastating losses, plural. Right. Without without that. I think to his credit, Greg is a great sportsman, tried to tried to keep, you know, a stiff upper lip with the press when it was all happening. And, and uh but but you're not human if it doesn't bother you, and it it for sure did. The um, the the, the whole live thing. Let, let's go ahead and, and get your thoughts on this because again, I your view as somebody who saw how much change was coming. This has been very turbulent to a degree that you can go. Well, he's made colossal mistakes, and he's made colossal mistakes. Is there one big biggest mistake? And if there is one. Who, who's responsible and what is it? Yeah, I mean, hindsight is so perfect, Gary, as you know. <laughs> we, you, you don't want to jump all over this. But but without question in my mind, when, when the Saudis first came to the PGA Tour and said, we want to invest in the tour, we're very interested in golf. Um, Jay Monahan, the board, whoever it was, in my view, didn't take time to sort of step back and say, okay, do we want to get in a war with people with 700 billion with a B in the fund that they're 
that they're planning on using to help invest in golf. The, the flip side of that would have been to say, wow, this is this is unmeasurable wealth. Think how this can help the PGA Tour. Hey, we sh- we'll stay in control, but why not let these guys invest in our product? Uh, and they didn't. They took the other route and really pissed them off, you know, throwing them out of the office, essentially, as I understand it. So you want to look back on where this sort of gestated. To me, that's a that's a major uh, point of no return. And of course, the Saudis then said, well, screw you. We'll just go do it ourselves. Hughes, a couple of things about what you just said. Um, One, just refusing to take the, the meeting. But even before that. You had you had the Premier Golf League, which essentially mm-hmm. they're the ones who kind of created this model, which was then subsequently to a degree kind of taken by the DP World Tour slash European Tour to the Saudis in some form or fashion. They evaluated it and said, we'll just we'll just take it ourselves. So so Jay didn't take that meeting with Andy Gardner in the Premier Golf League is insistent not to engage the Saudis. Is that a combination of insecurity about power maybe being relinquished? Or is that an absence of business acumen that's troubling? Or is it both? I, I think it's all of the above. And it's also arrogance, quite frankly, Gary. I mean, you you have a monopoly if you're running the PGA Tour. It's been a monopoly for 50, 60 years. Um, so perhaps you get an attitude of, you know, we're the best. We don't have to deal with anybody else. And, and I... There's some of that in there, and definitely. It's worth uh, sidebarring here, as, as as we say, to point out that you said that the Premier League, uh, you know, the, yes. the, the sports agency in Britain that had the Premier yes. League idea. And in the book, this, in my view, is the biggest revelation in our book, and you'll recognize it. Live the concept of a smaller tour with a handful of top stars, not 150 people in the field with higher prize money, with benefits for players, with a limited schedule so players have more time at home and to focus on the majors, was not invented by these guys in Britain or by Greg Norman. Greg Norman, of course, has called it his world tour for decades. Mark McCormick, once again, two steps ahead of everybody else, wrote about this in his book called Arnie, Evolution of a Legend. Mark came up with this idea in 1964. And we spell it all out in the book. A little mini chapter called Live Before Live. Because it, 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 once again, Mark figured it out. And and the person that killed the deal in the 60s and then killed it again later in the 90s when Greg um, was trying to to pitch his world tour idea was Arnold Palmer. Yeah. Who said, said we can't do this to the guys, the guys, meaning the rest of the tour. Arnold, rare perhaps, but superstar level, had empathy for all the guys that were out there just making a living. And he was not going to be the person, the catalyst that blew this all up. Yeah, Hughes, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought it up because, um, again, and I, I think, you know, Arnold, I, I, part of that was absolutely upbringing. Uh, his father, uh, his, his father's, you know, advancement in terms of what he wound up, you know, creating for himself. But it was not it was an arduous life physically. Uh, I think Arnie had an empathy for the common man uh, that was uncommon. But that that episode that you point out about Mark in this this vision of this and the fact that he literally folded it up and you said and correct me if I'm wrong, he never spoke about it again. Right. Nope. Well, he when Arnold turned it down in the 60s, you know, I didn't show up till 72. Yes. In about in about 1976, we talk about this in the book. One day, Mark called a meeting on a Saturday morning, which was very unusual. And there was no agenda. So four or five of us go into this room and Mark says, um, I want to tell you about the second tour. That's what he called it this time around. And we were all going, OK, what's that? And he said, guys, this is for real. He said, the money is on the table if we want to do this. I need you guys to tell me whether today's players would be willing to break away from the tour and do this. And we said, well, what do you mean the money's on the table? He had an airline that was going to be the sponsor and fly all the players around week to week. He had a hotel chain that was going to provide free hotels wherever they were. He had huge prize money uh, guaranteed by those two sponsors and also by the networks. 
the whole thing was laid out. I mean, the guy is just a visionary. And I remember my mouth dropped open. I was like, this guy is incredible. And thinking to myself, this could work. Um, and the concept sort of was we in those days, we would have needed Arnold and, you know, three or four of the other top guys and about 20 other players. That was the size. There were going to be 15 events. And of course, the first thing I said was, well, what about the majors, Mark? I mean, how? and he said the only major in his view that would ban players would be the PGA of America because it still had a yes. relationship with the PGA Tour. But he said the guys, and, and, and frankly, a lot of players consider that the fourth major in their minds. If you ask any player what two majors he'd most like to win in order, they never mention the PGA. Right. Uh, it's a great tournament and everything, but it just is, is sort of is sort of fourth unless they've the, won the PGA. Yeah, then it's number one. <laughs> Don't talk to Raymond Floyd about the PGA. He'll, he'll talk your head off, or Justin Thomas for that reason. But it, it was all there, and I thought, um, you know, you just you, and. He sort of dismissed the meeting and said, you guys think about it, you know, talk to some players, but for God's sake, confidentially. And uh, then from then on, we never talked about it again. And I'm sure what happened, he never articulated this to me, but I'm sure Arnold, when, when Mark's talking to Arnold about it again, said, Mark, we went through this once before. And interestingly enough, in 1994, when Greg did this presentation for the world tour at the shark shootout, a tournament that Greg and I created out in California. Arnold was there in the field. It was the 20 or 22 top players at the time. And Greg made this big pitch to the players. Yes. And Arnold, Arnold, this is the third time now, Greg laid it all out. The players are all looking at each other. Arnold stood up and said, guys, you do whatever you want, but I've been through this before. And he looked up at Greg and he said, Greg, how many times do you think Jack and Gary and I were approached about an idea like this? And we would never do it for the good of the game and more important for the good of the tour. And, and, and then he looked around the room and said again, I don't care what the rest of you guys do. Make up your own minds. It's up to you. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm out. And he turned and walked out of the room. Well, even in 1994, correct. such respect, such respect by the other players in the room. And, um, uh, how, you know, if I keep knocking this over, we're never going to have a bestseller. Well, that's why, so. that's, that's why I've, <laughs> I've, I've got my own copy, got my own prop. You're right. 30 years ago, he shut it down. Um, and it's, it's again, I, I so much of this is, uh, I, like I said, I mean, history will educate you about the past. It, I think it help explains uh, the present, uh, the, the Norman tiger, because you not only had those two, you know, here you are, you're representing all the biggest stars in golf and you're trying to satisfy all their needs. And it wasn't just you alone, but you're the guy. Um, the Norman Tiger vibe. Um, what were what are your recollections about their first couple of interludes? And did you think they had anything in common? Because it appears to me, based on everything that I've read, including the stuff in, in Rainmaker, there wasn't much there from the beginning. No, there wasn't. And the first time they got together, uh, I did it. Greg was uh, at home in Florida, got an off week. And Tiger was playing a junior tournament either in Florida or nearby. I can't remember, but he and he and Earl were down in that area. So I said to Greg first, as I recall, hey, Greg, you know, you've heard about this kid, Tiger Woods. He said, oh, yeah. I said, uh, would you like to meet him? And he said, sure. I said, he's, you know, going to be in the neighborhood here you think you guys would like to play around a golf or nine holes or something? He said, sure, I'd love to. And then I told Tiger, oh, look, number one player in the world uh, would like to at least sit down and talk to you or play some golf. And of course, Tiger couldn't wait. And so they played, they got together and I didn't think anything of it. And then I heard that they had only played nine holes and I waited a couple of days, didn't hear from either one. So I called Greg, I said, how'd it go with, the young hotshot he said yeah he hits it pretty far for a 17 year old that was about it and then i, I said okay well listen thanks for doing that i'm sure it meant a lot to him and i said call tiger and what did you think tiger said yeah the, the coolest part was all the little short game shots around the greens and stuff we messed around with that for a while so neither one was obviously uh in with striking up a, a, a lifetime relationship. And if you think about it, it makes sense. 
the number one player in the world is always checking out the landscape, Gary. Absolutely. Who's coming up? Who's going to be a threat to my domain? Who's Who are the guys I'm going to have to watch out for? So that's a built-in sort of resistance. And Tiger, as self-confident and, and believing in himself as much as he did, it was cool to play with the number one player, but I guarantee you in his mind, he thought, you know what? He didn't say this, but he, he's thinking, I can play with this guy, T to green. You know, I, obviously I, I got to improve my short game. I can see that watching him. Around. But that really came up about to me like, Hey, I, I don't want to be buddies with the number one guy in the world. I'm going to be knocking him off his throne pretty soon. So there's, that was sort of the beginning. And frankly, it, it went colder from there over time. Um, and I, and one of the reasons I'm pretty sure was when Tiger was playing those eight sponsor exemptions when he was still an amateur before he turned pro, you know, right at the end when he was uh, 19, 20 years old, people forget this. And it was a real uh, thorn in my side trying to convince Nike and Titleist to pay this kid all this money. He missed seven cuts out of eight appearances on the PGA Tour. So all kinds of people that are pretty knowledgeable in golf are saying, this kid's a match player. You know, yeah, he won all these USGA championships, but they're match play. He can't score. Anyway, um, when Tiger was going through that period, Greg said something to the press like, yeah, you know, it's just another another can't miss guy. Right. Look at him. He's struggling just like everybody else. So Tiger saw that quote that didn't make him any closer together. And then, of course, as we've seen in this live PGA Tour thing, which is what makes the book so interesting to me, is the two protagonists in this war, Norman, Liv, and Tiger defending the PGA yes. Tour, are, guy, are guys that I spent you know 20 years with. And who can better recount each of them than the guy that was their agent? No, it's you. It, it's it, There's no doubt. And the thing about Tiger um, is that you know, and I think that, you know, in terms of reading your words uh, with George, is that, you know, when you start to have to spend time with him, and I say have to, it was the way things were going, the evaluation of players at a younger age. And he was he was a prodigy. So there was a requirement for you to, to you know, do the reach out. He wasn't in college. No, hardly. I mean, he was a middle school kid. and And his father you know, has this very important role, huge role in his life. Um, and I know it's a lot of years removed. Did you ever at any point think that there was something dysfunctional at all about his upbringing? I didn't. Um, I, I kind of, as we went along and learned about Earl's first marriage, where he had three kids and didn't seem to be paying much attention to them as as life went on after the divorce and that happens you know uh, to people for sure but i thought um maybe this is earl making up for the, those days in his first marriage and children with attention and focus on tiger that he never had time or or chose to give to the others that definitely occurred to me um only children are frequently different I think, Gary, Nick Faldo was an only child. People always find quirky things about Nick. Uh, Tiger, uh, same deal. Um, we talk in the book, it's it's funny, because Earl was this hard-ass, you know, Green Beret, two tours in Vietnam, uh, tough-as-nails guy, exterior. And yet, when push came to shove, in my experience in the early years, Tita, Tiger's mom, was the one that laid the hammer down. <laughs> She used to tell me, I tell Tiger, you don't get A's in school. I put your clubs in the garage. <laughs> you know, it's funny how those roles are defined uh, or, or play out, I guess would be a better description. Um, dysfunctional. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. Uh, I did think sometimes, you know, was golf too much kind of shoved down Tiger's throat when he was a little kid. But I mean, he, I never saw any signs of anything, but he loved it. I mean, he loved every minute of it, couldn't get enough of it. And to this day, would rather hit balls and practice and putt for hours than, than do anything at age 47. Well, Hughes, you're identifying, you know, as he starts to rip off, you know, starting with the U.S. juniors and then the U.S. amateurs. And, and he goes to Stanford 
and and the wave is going to crest here and here you are and he's going to he's going to make the announcement right after Pumpkin Ridge um, and you're lining up not decent brands in these categories the bellwether brands for an obscene amount of quote at the time show up money um, who was the hardest nut to crack of of you know, in Titleist, look, you, and you speak glowingly about Wally Uline, and the guy, I've, I've been lucky enough to spend some time with him, and he's a, he's a wildly interesting, uh, very, very bright man. Um, they have market principles that they adhere to. Phil Knight, maybe not quite so much, but still. Um, who was the hardest nut to crack to say, look, you got to understand, this guy's different? They both were difficult in different ways. Wally because it's a golf company and always had been and steeped in golf and tradition and legacy, you know, rightfully raised the point I made a few minutes earlier. Hey, hey, Hughes, really? I mean, I've seen a lot of can't miss kids come along and miss. I mean, this guy's played eight PGA Tour events and he's missed the cut seven times. I mean, all due credit to the amateurs and the junior amateurs, but come on. Um, but Earl, I mean, uh, Wally's smart enough to realize this was a kind of a once in a lifetime thing, you know, worth rolling the dice on. And also at the time, uh, Gary, Titleist, traditionally a ball company, was expanding into golf clubs. So it was a wonderful opportunity for, for Wally to use Tiger as a vehicle to launch this line of clubs for better players, which they were in, in the process of doing. And I think that kind of gave Wally an out with, with any other players at Titleist who might bitch or moan about how much money supposedly he was being paid. You know, this is a special situation. Nike, on the other hand, was a, was a uh, it, it's a crazy place. I mean, people in our organization, the tennis part of our company had dealt with Nike for years. And before I first started going out there, they told me stories. I mean, it's, it's weird. It, it, it's a weird place. It, it's the people are uh, just different and they are so, you know, we tell in the book the story. I mean, the Nike campus has so many uh, bells and whistles and benefits for, for employees from the cafeterias to, you know, three or four different types of food and all kinds of basketball courts to running trails and stuff. You know, the biggest problem Nike has, they say, is getting the employees to go home at night. I mean, it's one of those crazy. And they had never been in golf. So and their outlook in general is suspicion and sort of paranoia. They're they're very into themselves and and hate agents as a rule. Um, ironically, Phil Knight in the end hired Howard Slusher, um, and he, he's on a poster which is in the photo section of my book. Howard Slusher was the the toughest pro football agent at the time. And lo and behold, Phil Knight, who never said a nice word about an agent in his life, hired Howard to be on the Nike Board of Advisors. So, um, but anyway, Nike was, that was a process of, hey, you you guys are succeeding in basketball. You're killing it in tennis. You know, you really should get into golf. And they're eh, not so sure, you know, that's a, that's hard goods and all that sort of stuff. And anyway, that was an educational project uh, process for me. I must have gone there five different times, kind of getting the lay of the land and figuring out, you know, what's what. And they, of course, doing their homework on is Tiger Woods somebody that we want to get involved with? And, and a bigger question, do we even want to get involved in golf? But my timing there, Gary, was was uh, incredibly fortuitous. Nike loved superstars, whether it was Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, Michael Jordan. And those, those three were sort of winding down in the mid-1990s. So Nike had to now make a move and pick up the next superstar, or in this case, superstar to be. So they rolled the dice, you know, and maybe I did a great sales job. Maybe they were smart enough to realize that uh, that golf was the sport they needed to be in. But um, as, as you mentioned, the numbers were just outrageous, and I could hardly get them out when I was making the pitch. They were so kind of stupid compared to golf numbers. But I said in the book, um, the pitch I made to Nike was, look, and there was a guy there named Steve Miller who was a, uh, the director of sports marketing. And he was a great guy and he was very helpful to me. And I'm hoping Steve listens to this podcast. I can't <laughs> find his address anywhere. He actually last, last poll was running the, the, the pre I think the professional bowlers association. So I'm going to find him because I want to send him a book and I'm going to write him a nice note. But Steve was incredibly helpful and he was a non Nike guy. He was kind of like a regular person with all these kind of different people out there. And, um, 
and and he was very very helpful to me. But I, I said to Steve, look, here's the pitch. Tiger's going to cost an unbelievable amount of money. And here's why. I'm not shopping this. You know, the typical agent thing is I'd take this to Reebok, Nike's offer, and then I'd run it up against uh, Lacoste or whatever. I so believe that Nike was the right place for Tiger that I said, um, it's a big number for sure, but you guys are used to big numbers. And um, this will give you Tiger Woods, the, the dominant force in golf to come. Of course, we didn't know. Um, and they bought it. The um, You mentioned Michael, and I think it's important because Tiger really took golf uh, way outside this very affluent, narrow lane. Uh, and, and with you, you know, he burst into the mainstream of, of everything sports-wise, but also culture as well. And so he became not just a big star in golf, he became a huge star in sports and beyond very, very quickly. Being around him, did he did he take ample time to understand the opportunity there? Did you did you find frustration trying to make time to explain to him what was next in the next step in the next category? Or did he just want to get lost in the pursuit of beating whoever was in front of him? The latter, a hundred percent. He was oblivious to it. Couldn't care less. Um, he said to me, I think in the middle of the first year, his first year as a pro, he said, all this stuff on the outside, dude, all this money, he said, that, that you're generating, it's paper money. I said, what do you mean? He said, see this check I just wanted in Las Vegas when I won the play? That's what I care about. It was so, and we talk about it in the book, Gary, that the, the difference between Greg and Tiger, Greg, Greg obviously loved golf, loved to compete, loved to win, and and globally an icon but really one of the things that drove him to that success i believe was the the riches and and fame and fortune that came with it you know the seven ferraris in the garage and the ocean going yacht and the and the private planes and the gulf streams and all that tiger could absolutely care less about his outside income and in the book i point out this will shock people all of that money millions and millions and millions remember he had 60 million dollars guaranteed before he teed it up in milwaukee as a pro and i say guaranteed for five years if he missed every single cut titleist and nike had no outs because i'd purposely structured them that way and that's pretty unbelievable and he never once said hughes i just got to take a moment and tell you those are unbelievable fucking deals thank you zip it was like Okay, uh, wh where do I, I got to have some time to practice, okay? Um, I want to go over and putt for a while, and, and, and then I got to go to the gym. It was the, the wealth, the generational wealth theory was actually, this will shock people, it was an intrusion into his life. It wasn't even something neutral. He hated it. The photo session, the, the appearances, the stuff he had to do, and believe me, we restricted those to the absolute yes. minimum. He was making more money from those two contracts and doing less required appearances than Arnold Palmer, who was still very much in, at the top of his game in terms of outside income. Arnold would have to do many more you know, photo sessions for, for Company X than Tiger did, and Tiger was making five times as much money as Arnold. I mean, go figure, right? And just once in a while, you know, if you're an agent and you and you and you you know get so lucky as I did or or, or whatever the factors were and you have a tiger woods and you do this kind of work it's like anybody you like somebody to say to you gary hell of a podcast nice job that is really you couldn't you couldn't have been better today never nothing and double barreled for me mccormick never did that to me either that's just how he was mark would tell other people i'd get stuff secondhand from other people boy you know mark was going on and on he was about the job you've done building the golf division and signing all these number one never Never once looked me in the eye and said, you know, I, I got to tell you, you know, w without you, this company, but oh, whatever. Is it that hard for people to do? Or was that something about my personality, Gary? It, you know, as I reflect on this, that, that people just didn't feel that was something they needed to do to me. Or, <laughs> so in terms of reflections, maybe I'm off on a tangent here, but. The, um, the, the relationships that he had, it, look, teams of people, which we have now in men's professional golf, 
you know, the physio. Which I hate. Yeah, with the, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, if I hear, if I hear, this started in tennis, by the way, folks. Yes. <laughs> when these 13-year-olds were in a tournament and look up, I want to thank my team. Oh, God, please stop. <laughs> now golf, every golfer, Gary. We. Every golfer. We. My team, my team. They're hitting any shots? I don't think so. Yeah, uh, I the, the we part of it is, I don't know when we crossed that threshold, but my God, we're on the other side of it. Who did he listen to? Did he listen to his father intently when he had to? Was he? Did he listen to his dad? Yes, hundred uh, percent. Earl was always the factor. Whenever there was a you know a moment where a decision had to be made, or Tiger needed to kind of wanted reassurance or somebody seconding whatever his opinion was at the time, it was always Earl. And that was one of the challenges. I mean, as I look back on this, um, I was 30 years older than this kid. And part of my demise, as I believe, as I try to reflect on it, there was some of that in there. Um, It's no excuse. I mean, Michael Jordan had a guy named David Falk who worked for him uh, for years. And I'd Mm -hmm. like to point out Ty, the tiger that Michael remains loyal to David Falk, um, and sadly wasn't to me. But I think the age the age factor, you know, with Tiger was twenty and I'm fifty, and so as the relationship unfolded, even the early years when Tiger was still an amateur, and once he turned pro, um, I really re- related to and dealt more with Earl Woods than Tiger. Obviously, some of both, but. Tiger perhaps wanted somebody more his age. Uh, I'm not sure. He never articulated that. That's me. Yeah, Hughes, that's that's another part of this book that people will find interesting is that, look, nobody, I hope, you know, hopes for people to lose jobs. Um, but, but you were in a, in an industry where it happened habitually. It happened to the best. It happened to you. Um, you, you, and look, you're self-critical about what you could have done better, not only for him, but, but for others as well along the way. Um, he is a very comfortable confrontational person in the environment where he's best, which is on a golf course. Nobody thrives in confrontation better than him. You put it out the match play thing. Some people are preconditioned to go, you know, and it's me and you, and one of us is going to get bloody. And I'm okay with me getting bloodied, but you're going to go down, and I'm going to keep you down. I don't think he likes confrontation in other aspects of his life. Is that fair? Understatement. Huge understatement. He hates it, and he never did it. Whether it was uh, firing John L. Salmo, his first uh, 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 teaching pro in California, or his early girlfriends, you know, the stories of after Tiger broke up with his girlfriend, he'd walk p- right past her in the hall in, the high, in, in high school and never say a word to her. This is how he dealt with stuff. He did it with uh, the lawyer, John Merchant, who, who negotiated with me on Tiger's IMG representation agreement. He did it with uh, caddies over the years. He did it with me. Uh, it, when it's over, it's over. And, and, and there's no discussion. His mind is made up. And there's no you know, reconsidering nothing. It, it's it's a wonderful point you make. He's so the other way in competition, and maybe he just had enough of that on the golf course and couldn't deal with it. But he, as I say in the book, you know, he told me in front of Alworth that day when uh, he didn't even want me to come down. He called me up and said, "I'm going, you know, I want to make a change." I said, "Well, we got to talk about this, Tiger. This is ridiculous. What, what? What? This is the first I've ever heard of this." He said, "My mind's made up." I said. I can't accept that. I got to fly down and, and talk to you. Don't come down here. It's a waste of time. I did and met him in front of, at the front door of the Isleworth Clubhouse. He told, me, he told me he wanted to meet there. I thought we'd go inside and get a room and at least, you know, I've done a pretty good job for this kid. I, I sort of like an explanation before you make this, uh, you know, huge decision. And uh, he said, no, no. He said, I, I, I wish you hadn't come. You know, it's over and turned and walked away. And he's never said a word to me or tried to reach me or talk to me for 25 years. And that's how he deals with it. When it's over, it's over. Hughes, the, the, um, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, how, you know, you, when, when you leave IMG, you've got a, you've got a non-compete, you basically, you know, go silent. Uh, and then you, you, you never really reappear. Uh, and, and now here we are all these years later, was there a period, um, 
with respect to Tiger that you would have liked to have had. It's not about trying to explain why he might have made a mistake, but just some type of cleansing. Did you hold on to the idea that that would happen five years later, 10 years later, and then you eventually just say, I'm never going to speak to him again? Yeah, I did. Given his given his history that we just went over of how yes. he deals with these things, I, I never expected to hear from him. But Gary, just imagine, I get, he, Tiger tells me that he's, he's moving on. He doesn't want me in his life anymore. And I said to him, one of the things I did have a chance to say that morning uh, in, in Isleworth in Orlando was, Tiger, I'm just telling you, it may not make any difference to you, but this could be the end of my career at IMG if you, if you do this. And like, couldn't care less. And sure enough, two months later, McCormick terminated me, severance agreement, yes. But again, like the Tiger situation, Gary, no resolution, no sitting down with Mark and him explaining to me why. And I thought that was just like the double whammy of within two months of each other. And and in the intervening years, all these years really have never had any resolution. So part of that was the book, um, I think, kind of getting it out. And I didn't expect this. But as we went through the process, I mean, we're working, George and I, on this every week frequently every day back and forth back and forth reconstructing what happened my stories um it was cathartic for me it mm. really was it was getting it out i mean a shrink would have a, a field day with this it was getting out all these unresolved uh things within me that happened as a result of, of these terminations greg was a different story but i think it's fair to say you know i worked for greg for 11 years yeah and Almost invariably, I was going to say inevitably, superstars, whatever sport it's in, go off on their own. It, it, Arnold's an exception, and there are other exceptions. But just go through the list in our sport. Jack Nicholas left IMG, founded his own his own kind of management team. Um, uh, Johnny Miller did it with the guy that worked for him for six or seven years at the beginning of his career. Lee Trevino did it twice. Um, Rory McIlroy has done it in our era. And so I don't begrudge Greg um, for that. It was it was hurtful when he when he when he ended the relationship with IMG because we were really good friends. But those things happen. And frequently within a within a management firm, as would happen with Tiger, relationships kind of come to an end or should be changed. And a, an athlete will move to another agent in the firm rather than leave. And guess what? That's what Tiger did. Um, so maybe he thought enough of me and IMG to do that. Uh, but it, his, my, my great energy in, in doing this book, and I'm really glad I did it for that reason, because it, it, it made me think about things and uh, that I'd kind of pushed aside because they were too painful all this time. You, you, you know, I think about, and Mark Steinberg has been with Tiger, you know, since, and in addition to, we were talking about the team, Hughes. We know who these people are to a, to a pretty large degree. They're content creators. You know, Golf Channel was born, you know, a year after Tiger turned pro. You talk about great timing. Um, but the 24-hour, but, but the hey, I know who that is. We know who the caddies are. We know who the physio is. And we know who the agents are. Listen, I remember distinctly the image of you when he won in 97 wearing the not-off-the-rack sport coat with the wavy hair <laughs> and, and, and the cool sunglasses. You were the guy, man, and then you lose your job. Relevancy has, there's value to relevancy. Some, very little for some, more so with others. And it can be crippling when it goes away. Well, and the, yeah, great points, Gary. And the problem for me is working as hard as I did. I, I sort of found myself emulating McCormick all those years and working like crazy and having my family fall apart, worked even harder. So when, when that happens to someone like me, yes, it's, it's your identity is so infused with your job that it's, it, it's one thing to be rejected at work. It's another thing for essentially for people to say, you know, I really, he's the kind of guy I don't want to be with long-term. So that was sort of the message from my wife, from Greg at the end, and then from Tiger. So you, you take those things internally after a while and it bothers you. I um I said at the beginning I'll say it again I I there there's so much in this book that'll make you smile make you laugh um 
But also, yeah, there are some revealing elements, but I don't think there is anything about gotcha or, oh, gosh, I wish he hadn't have said that. Um, but, and, and, you know, whether it's Curtis, whether it's Raymond, whether it's Greg, Tiger, of all the clients you had, who do you think you might have done the greatest disservice to either for overextending them or underrepresenting them as a valuable brand to whatever degree? Well, the underrepresenting part I'll, I'll, I'll do first because I, I would never be accused of that. <laughs> One of the things I, I, I was most accused of is, is, is pushing people too hard or being perceived as pushing people too hard. It never happens that way because the client always makes the decision. But, um, you know, a regret going way back, you know, Laura Ba was a, yes. my first client at IMG and she was incredibly talented, you know, won the, won the U.S. Women's Amateur at, at age, uh, very young age, uh, 16 years old, and then had this uh, wonderful charisma and visual appeal, which IMG fully took advantage of and marketed her to the uh, to the extreme. And she made a lot of money. Um, but she she would frequently say to me as in those early years, you know, I just don't have enough time to work and practice on my game because I'm going to Japan all the time. And I know this money is great and it's set me up for the future. But, you know, should I really be, you know, what's what's the right choice here? And that's a theme in the book, which you picked up on, Gary, balance, whether it's me um, trying, you know, a driven personality by nature, um, trying to succeed in this sort of cutthroat world of agency um, and not making enough time for my family, which ultimately cost me. Or is it the tour pro? Another example, Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers was a successful player on the tour, but nothing special for his first few years. And then he had a year, and, and for all you golf Historic fans out there, year. You, you really should look this up. It's so overlooked. I, I submit, Gary, it's one of the it's one of the four or five greatest years in golf history. He won the British Open. He won the Australian Open. He won the Texas Open. He won Heritage. He won Firestone. He won the Suntory Open in Japan. He won the New South Wales Open in Australia. Everywhere the guy went, just he'd been he'd been uh, something happened, and that one is frequently talked about as the over the overdue by Hughes Norton, you know, because as he bill went all over the world in those days, appearance fees internationally sure. were huge. And he went all over the world and made a fortune. Um, and uh, my defense always was, look, uh, uh, my job is just to create opportunities and present them to my clients. And the beauty of IMG is because we have so much other revenue and resources. If, if Gary Williams turns down this particular deal, it's no big, it's fine. Okay, we lost the commission of 20% of $200,000, but we'll make it up somewhere else. And besides, our tennis division is really doing well. It's the agents with one or two clients that, that are more apt to push their people, in my opinion, to do stuff they shouldn't. But back to Bill Rogers. Um, so I you know, bore the brunt of a lot of this criticism and, and perhaps deserve. But Bill himself, and it took a few years, came out and said, you know, uh, I probably shouldn't have done all that, but I knew exactly what I was doing. Mm. And I had a hell of a time doing it. And I set my, myself and my family up, you know, for the rest of our lives. And, and I really wouldn't do it any differently. So that is kind of redemption for me when it, it came a little bit later. But, but that's, that's the problem in terms of the, the player feels pushed. And frankly, Gary, a lot of the stuff that IMG was able to develop is so overwhelmingly attractive. I can't tell you the number of times a client would say to me, wow, you know, I'm supposed to be off that week, but how can I turn that down? And that's this. And of course, fast forward, live. I don't care what your morals are or, or what your allegiance to the PGA Tour is. When someone puts $50 million in front of somebody or more, uh, how do I turn that down? Yeah, that, that was one of two last things I wanted to ask you. If you were representing players right now, do you think your stable would be mixed between guys who you would maximize, um, you know, their, their marketability and, and their value? Do you think you'd have some guys that live and some guys on the PGA Tour? I think for sure, because people are always different. But, you know, you followed golf for so long. You know this better than anybody. Golf is there's such a fine line between – huge success and and literally losing it um ian baker finch unbelievable talent 
bunch of people told him he didn't hit the ball far enough, changed his swing, ruined his career. Hubert Green, they said, you hit the ball too low. You got to hit it higher. Um, and well-meaning, they, they make adjustments, but they end up screwing up. Their, so I think in the back of all players' minds is the thought, you know what? No matter how well I'm doing right now, this could end. And, and, and especially now with so many talented kids coming along and year after year having to sustain this level of excellence. And that thought, if I'm a player, would certainly motivate me to listen to a live offer because uh, because that that kind of money is it, it's ludicrous. Last thing the, for the kid who lived somewhat of a nomadic young life uh, before heading to college. Um, and like I said at the beginning, um, I, I can tell that you love doing radio. I, I can tell that you loved whatever shift you got. Any guy who would do the overnight shift back when terrestrial <laughs> radio and, and those personalities were massive, massive stars. Um, and then you made the choice. You, you, you choose against maybe a, a life and a career in television, in the industry of television, to represent people. What, of all the things you did, what, what do you maybe miss now? What have you missed in the years since? I think the excitement of when you, when you, I mean, Tiger Woods is a, perhaps a bad example because he's such a over and above superstar, but just the fun of, of dealing with people that you look up to already because they're so talented at something that we all struggle with and the fun of interacting and selling. I mean, if you, you have to be able to sell as an agent, we haven't touched on, you know, what, what, characteristics a, a good agent possesses but it's almost any walk of life gary same as yours you know you've got to be able to sell and selling is a challenge and that whole nike and titleist uh approach that i made i mean it's really it's exciting and energizing to dream up stuff and and then see it come to fruition so i miss all of that but i'll tell you what i don't miss i don't miss uh the life the never-ending road trip you know the hotels and the airplanes that that, that go with this job I don't miss uh, working for certain clients that that are always complaining or, or don't appreciate the job that you're doing. Um, I don't miss the uh, inevitable search for the next superstar. Frequently, you identify the wrong people, and so rarely you pick out the right ones. Um, and I also, at the end, you know, IMG became a kind of a dirty word uh, mm. in uh, in sports. I mean, we were the New York Yankees of the 1920s. We were hated by a lot of people. So constantly defending the company that I work for. All of that, as I think back, maybe it's rationalization now, but I don't miss any of that. So, uh, and besides, I couldn't change what's happened, but I am really happy that I could put this down on paper. And, you know, I've said to people, Gary, I want to share with you this. I'm lucky enough, fortunate enough to have invested pretty well and taken the severance agreement that Mark gave me and sustaining a pretty good, pretty good life financially. There's nothing financial about this book whatsoever. I told this story really for my kids and grandkids to know what I did in life. And I think armed with that approach, it's better. The book is better as a result. There's nothing in there that I'm trying to persuade anybody at or to. You've read it. It's just kind of an authentic, here's what life was like. And what I love, just to conclude, is the three, the th it's kind of a three pronged narrative. My life as an agent, which we've spent most of this hour talking about, you know, it's pretty cool. If I were not in sports and like golf, I would love to listen to this podcast or read the book. But we do a lot of background on IMG yes. and sports management and how sports management grew because of Mark McCormick. That's interesting to people. And the other part, people don't realize with the billions of dollars in, in professional golf today, when I went out there in 1972, it was a mom and pop operation. It really was. And we, we, we chronicle the stuff that Dean Beeman did. Brilliant, brilliant guy to grow the tour and make this life and this the, the financial situation that it is today available to these players. So there are three things kind of swirling around in the book. I think you'll agree. And it, it makes a good read. It, it does. It, it's, again, for people who don't know enough or, or just simply are not educated on, on IMG, it wasn't just representing people. It was event management. It was ideation. It was marketing services. It was sponsorship. It was a. It became a monolith, and and when it did, it then became a three-letter word that people didn't like. Oh God, um, you know, you're 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 tethered to them, and there's no doubt, Hughes. 
and again, this is not psychoanalysis, um, you're sharing with your family. There's no doubt. You're sharing your own vulnerabilities and, and, and decisions you had to make and choices that you, you made and some you didn't um, that I, I, think are, I think are revealing in a very endearing way. The book, again, is Rainmaker, Super Agent Hughes Norton and the Money Grab Explosion of Golf from Tiger to Live and Beyond. And it is about beyond. Um, Hard to believe that the kid who gave Mark McCormick a ride back to the airport and you missed the exit, he had a wheel back around, he thought he was going to miss his flight, and he's fumbling around with note cards, uh, that here you are. And I know you mentioned his name, Chris Molhop. Um, he's told me these years have been spent, a lot of, a lot of reading, you're, you're a voracious reader. And I also know that Gil Hans has tuned up your golf course uh, there in Cleveland, so I know you're happy about that. So life is good, right? We'll be happier if you come and play and see what Gil did, Gary. I'd love to have a round of golf with you and uh, get to know you a little bit better. But th this is this has been terrific. Thanks so much. Thank you for doing this again. The book is Rainmaker. It's great to see you. Thank you. All the best, Gary. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Gary. That was great. Very, very good. I, I'm telling you, look, I could have talked to you, and we will, because um, I will come and see you because I just want to spend time there's so much in here. Like, yeah. I, again, I, I'm telling you that the, the, the story about having to go to Raymond's place and pack it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And there's a bunch of things I didn't say in the podcast. I, I meant to. There's a bunch of stories I didn't tell, you know, and it's funny. because the Simon and, Schu Simon and Schuster's of the world, you know this. They come on. We want we want the dirt. I ran this book by Rick Riley when I first started. Yes. I sent him the sample chapter and his comment was great. He said, he was, I enjoyed it. He said, but it, you'll never sell it. He said, you should self-publish. I said, why? He said, publishers want the dirt. There's not enough dirt in here. You know, there's not enough really juicy stuff in here. <laughs> so who knows? But Gary, honestly, you are, I mean, I'm a pretty, uh, uh, I'm a good evaluator of stuff like this. You, you are light years above other people in just simple vocabulary, how you articulate things. It is a pleasure to talk to you, and I'd really like to get you know know you better. You sort of remind me of myself in a way, and uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I will. Let's get Chris, and I'll come out there, uh, and I would love to see what Gil's done to the golf course. He's. Um, I was just down uh, at a new place that, again, you and I could talk about what's happening in the industry of golf. This Apogee project. My God, yeah. the, the gluttony. Now, the golf course is very, very nice, and, and Gil is he's so sensible, and he can take flat land, and he can use natural features, and the golf course is it's very, very nice. But, my God, 650000 for initiation, a 70,000-square-foot huh. clubhouse over here, 40000 over here. We got IV drips in the fitness center. What are we doing? No, exactly. That is crazy. And of course, there'll they'll be a line of wealthy people. They have you know, a wonder. line. They have 300 yeah. already signed up. They have no facilities. <laughs> Not for me. Thanks. <laughs> well, listen, I know that uh, this is the first or, or maybe the 10th of many. Uh, enjoy the process of doing this. I know you like talking about it. But again, I, I, uh, I loved it. I really did. Take care. It's great seeing you. You too, Gary. Okay. Hope we see you soon. Thanks. Thank you again to Hughes Norton. Again, the book is Rainmaker that he co-authored with George Pepper about his entire career. And I would say this is that this is not about his side against somebody else's side, whether it be Greg Norman or Curtis Strange or Raymond Floyd or, or Tiger Woods. It's not that. It's his story. And his story is really, really interesting. And there is historical context that you gain by reading this book about what IMG became and what it is in terms of the roadmap to how to build an agency for all of sports today. The title again is Rainmaker. The author is Hughes Norton. I thank him. Most importantly, though, we thank you for listening and watching this Five Clubs podcast. We'll see you next time.